Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in and welcome back to another episode of the Carnivore Kitchen Podcast. Steven here with Team Euphoric and today we're going to be having some medium ground beef and talking about exercise selection. And if you want to learn how to use ground beef to make a carnivore quesadilla, then check out the recipe link in the description. The name of today's episode is the right tool for the job. One of the most important things when designing an effective exercise program is to choose the appropriate exercises and the exercises that you choose must be specific to the person's goal and their needs. The exercises you select will also dictate all of the other training variables in the training program such as sets, repetitions, intensity, tempo, time under tension and rest periods, as well as the way in which you will order the exercises and the type of training split that you will be using. When it comes to exercise selection, we have three main groups of exercises. Power exercises, core or compound exercises, and assistance or isolation exercises. Your core exercises, or your compound exercises, are your multi-joint movements and will include all of your primal movement patterns – squat, lunge, bend, push, pull, and twist. These types of exercises will be terrific for all individuals and most training goals as they recruit a larger number of muscles and make each of those individual muscles work synergistically to complete a task, which is what our bodies are designed to do. One of the great things about core exercises is that there are an unlimited amount of exercise variations that you can perform and you will only be limited by your imagination. They can be performed as calisthenics exercises, meaning you are performing them with nothing but your body weight while sometimes using minimal equipment, or you can load each of the exercises and perform them using external resistance with equipment such as dumbbells, barbells, kettlebells, cable machines, or odd implements like sandbags, Bulgarian bags, atlas stones, or tractor tires. They can also be regressed and progressed based off each individual starting point. Let's use the squat pattern as an example of how we can progress the squat pattern for someone who completely lacks the ability to squat properly and to be able to have them squat properly within 6 months. You can start with a prone squat, then progress to a kneeling squat, split squat, heel elevated squat, box squat, and then a full squat. Next, let's discuss power exercises. A power exercise is essentially a core exercise that is performed explosively. You can think of these exercises as things such as your Olympic lifts and plyometric exercises. Power exercises are terrific for athletes who require speed and power or explosiveness for their sport. Sprinters, baseball players, football players, hockey players, basketball players, golfers, Olympic lifters, etc. Personally, I'm not a fan of using power exercises when writing exercise programs unless it is either a professional athlete whose sport requires speed and power or someone really wants to learn how to perform a specific power exercise. Aside from that, I just don't think that the risk is worth the reward. It's also worth noting that if someone has never performed a power exercise before, you want to make sure that they can properly perform all of the corresponding core exercises for that movement so they can reduce the chance of injury. Let's use the snatch as an example. The snatch requires the lifter to explosively lift a bar as high as they can while catching the bar overhead with straight arms while in a deep squat position and then standing up. The snatch utilizes the following primal movement patterns. The bend pattern when you are deadlifting, the pull pattern when you are doing the upright row, the squat pattern when you need to do the deep overhead squat, and the push pattern by maintaining a static overhead press. Therefore, if someone is coming to you because they are either an athlete where the snatch will benefit their performance, or they are just really interested in learning how to perform the snatch, then you want to make sure that they don't have any movement dysfunctions in the squat, bend, push, and pull patterns, or the chance that they will injure themselves will be significantly greater. Lastly, we have assistance exercises, or isolation exercises. An isolation exercise is an exercise where only one joint is moving. They recruit fewer groups of muscles and are terrific for the purposes of rehabilitation or for individuals looking to either grow a specific body area or to enhance, aka assist, with one of their compound exercises where a specific muscle or muscles may be hindering their performance in that lift. It's also worth noting that we need to make a distinction between assistance exercises as a broad category of exercises and accessory exercises as a type of exercise in a training program to assist with a particular lift. When looking at the classification of exercise types, then all assistance exercises are isolation exercises and will be synonymous. However, an accessory exercise as part of your workout program doesn't have to be an isolation exercise and can be either a compound exercise or an isolation exercise. Let's use an example of a power lifter wanting to improve their bench press. Oftentimes, people who are really weak in the bench press will have really weak external shoulder rotators, scapular retractors, and elbow extensors. 
So one of the ways in which you can write an exercise program for a power lifter with the goal of improving their bench press can be as follows. You can warm up with a sideways neutral grip hand over opposite hip external rotation and superset that with a mid pulley trap three raise. Then as their primary exercise, you can have them do the bench press. As their supplemental exercise, you can have them do a close grip bench press. As an accessory exercise, you can have them do a behind the neck press. And then as your other exercise or their cool down, you can do exactly what you did in the warm up and have them superset the sideways neutral grip hand over opposite hip external rotation and the mid pulley trap three raise. Now, let's take that exact workout and just make one minor modification. The minor modification we are going to make is to the accessory exercise. If we keep the exact program but change the accessory exercise from the behind the neck press to the seated lateral raise, now we are changing up the accessory exercise from a compound exercise to an isolation exercise. In the first example, our accessory exercise is a behind the neck press, which would be considered a core exercise or compound exercise, as it is a multi-joint movement since both the shoulder joint and elbow joints are moving. In the second example, our accessory exercise is a seated lateral raise, which would be considered an assistance exercise or isolation exercise, as it is a single joint movement since only the shoulder joint is moving. Both exercises are utilizing the push pattern, and both exercises are considered accessory exercises. But, in the first program, we are using a core exercise as our accessory exercise, and in the second program, we are using an assistance exercise as our accessory exercise. So, just remember that assistance exercise and isolation exercise are synonymous with each other, but assistance exercise and accessory exercise are not. The same is true with a supplemental exercise. As the purpose of a supplemental exercise is to work the lifter's weakest point in order to assist them with their main lift, a supplemental exercise can be either a core exercise or an assistance exercise. Now that we know about the three distinct classifications of exercises, which exercises should we choose when writing a custom exercise program? Well, it's all going to come down to the goal of the individual and whether they want to look better, feel better, or perform better, and the results of their assessment or needs analysis. Let's take a look at three hypothetical individuals. The first is a mother with a newborn child who wants to lose some fat and look better. The second is an elderly man with low back, hip, and knee pain who wants to feel better. And the third example is going to be a professional MMA fighter who wants to be stronger and faster so that they can perform better. In the first example, a mother with a newborn child who wants to lose some fat and look better, if there were no issues that arose during the assessment, then core exercises or compound exercises should make up the majority of her training program as compound exercises use more muscles which means they burn more calories which is going to be important since her goal is specifically fat loss. Isolation exercises would just be too inefficient and take up too much time. If you use compound exercises in her training program, then it could look something like this. You can have her do dumbbell goblet squats, seated horizontal cable rows, a dumbbell bench press, and a Romanian barbell deadlift. The dumbbell goblet squat will take care of the core muscles, lumbar extensors, hip extensors, knee extensors, plantar flexors, shoulder flexors, and elbow flexors. The seated horizontal cable row will take care of the shoulder extensors, elbow flexors, scapular retractors, lumbar extensors, and wrist and finger flexors. The dumbbell bench press will take care of the shoulder flexors, shoulder adductors, elbow extensors, and wrist flexors and extensors, and the Romanian barbell deadlift will take care of the core muscles, lumbar extensors, hip extensors, knee flexors, plantar flexors, and wrist and finger flexors. If we were to use isolation exercises instead, then we would need to use a minimum of 10 different isolation exercises. Abdominal crunches, back extensions, hip extensions, hamstring curls, knee extensions, calf raises, pec flies, cable pull downs, tricep extensions, and bicep curls to replace the four compound exercises to target the same groups of muscles, which would take 150% more time. So, for a mother with a newborn child who wants to lose some fat and look better, then prioritizing compound exercises over isolation exercises makes more sense as they recruit more muscles and burn more calories, which means that she can spend less time in the gym and more time with her newborn baby. In the second example, an elderly man with low back, hip, and knee pain who wants to feel better, let's say that when you performed your assessment, you found that he had forward head carriage, thoracic hyperkyphosis, lumbar hypolordosis, an anterior pelvic tilt, valgus knees, and collapsed arches. And he will be working out from home and has no equipment available, but he has an unlimited amount of time. Well, for this individual, isolation exercises would be very beneficial as you can use isolation exercises to specifically target each of the areas in which you found the various musculoskeletal dysfunctions, and your exercise program can look something like this. 
You can have him do some mobilization exercises such as the McKenzie press up, the foam roller horizontal thoracic mobilization, and pelvic rocks. Then for the strengthening exercises, you can have him perform a supine hip extension, lower abdominal segmental strengthening, a prone cobra, a Peterson step up, a towel toe curl, and the extensor chain wall lean. And then for stretching, you can have him stretch his psoas major, rectus femoris, pectoralis major, and his suboccipital muscles. The McKenzie press-up can be used to increase extension in the lumbar spine, and the pelvic rocks, supine hip extension, lower abdominal strengthening, psoas major stretch, and rectus femoris stretch can be used to correct the anterior pelvic tilt. The foam roller horizontal, prone cobra, and pectoralis major stretch can be used to address the thoracic hyperkyphosis, and the extensor chain wall lean and the suboccipital stretch can be used to correct the forward head carriage. Lastly, the Peterson step-up can be used to increase strength in the vastus medialis, which can help with the valgus knees, and the towel toe curl can be used to strengthen the toe flexors and build up the arches. These isolation exercises may take a bit more time to complete than if you were to use compound exercises, but for an elderly man with low back, hip, and knee pain who wants to feel better and who has no access to gym equipment but an unlimited amount of time to perform the workouts, then this workout using these isolation exercises would be better for his specific goals and his needs. In our third and final example, a professional MMA fighter who wants to be stronger and faster so that they can perform better, then you're going to want to use a combination of power exercises, core exercises, and assistance exercises depending on which phase of their training they are in. Let's say that you are coaching a professional MMA fighter who already has phenomenal conditioning but really needs to increase their speed, strength, and power, and who is coming to you with some minor injuries from their prior fight. For this fighter, you would want to start with a transition phase to address any minor injuries that they may have sustained during their previous fight camp or in the fight itself. During this transition phase, assistance exercises or isolation exercises will be very beneficial to prioritize. Once the transition phase has been completed, you will then move on to anatomical adaptation and hypertrophy training phases. The goal during these training phases will be to build up some muscle as the conditioning work and weight cut that led up to the prior fight would have likely resulted in some muscle loss. During the anatomical adaptation and hypertrophy training phases, you would want to prioritize core exercises or compound lifts. Isolation exercises such as biceps curls or triceps extensions can be very counterproductive during these training phases as all of the blood rushing to the extremities can negatively affect their skill training such as their striking and grappling practices. Personally, the only time I ever use assistance exercises during these phases of training is in the warm-up, and the exercises that I use are typically carried over from the transition phase of training. As for the main portion of the workout, I like to stick to the basics. Squats, deadlifts, lunges, dumbbells and barbell presses, and chin-ups and dumbbell, barbell, or cable rows. Once the anatomical adaptation and hypertrophy phases have been completed, then it would be time to move on to strength phase. During the strength phase, the types of exercises will typically be the same as they were during the hypertrophy phase, with the main difference being the exercises will be performed at higher intensities with longer rest periods. Once the strength phase has been completed, then it's time to move on to a power phase and conversion to sport-specific power. During the power phase, you want to pick a combination of power exercises and core exercises and have the movements mimic the movements that they will be performing in the cage or the ring, and the training program can look something like this. You can have them perform an atlas stone lift, medicine ball throw with a twist, walking lunges with resistance bands, supinated single arm kettlebell swings, and slam ball overhead slams. The atlas stone lift would be much better for an MMA fighter than something like a conventional barbell deadlift during the power phase because it would do a much better job of mimicking the grappling aspect of their sport, since when you lift an atlas stone, you are doing so with a rounded spine and picking up the atlas stone with an open palm, which is precisely what you are doing when you are grappling another human being. You're never grappling with a neutral spine, and your palms are always going to be open to try and get wrist control or control of various other body areas that are much thicker than your standard barbell. The medicine ball throw with a twist would be much better for an MMA fighter than something like a barbell bench press, because it would do a much better job of mimicking the striking aspect of their sport, since when you are striking, you are doing so from a standing position and, if you are throwing a hook, you are striking with the contralateral arm and twisting at the torso. If all punching was done while laying on your back and by punching with both arms at the same time, then doing something like a barbell bench press might make sense during this training phase. 
Walking lunges with resistance bands would be much better for an MMA fighter than something like a forward step barbell lunge, because it would do a much better job of mimicking the grappling aspect of their sport, since when you shoot in for a takedown, you're essentially doing walking lunges, and by doing so against the horizontal resistance of the resistance band, then it will be more directly applicable than having the downward vertical resistance of a barbell. Unless you enjoy showing off to the crowd and lunging while holding your opponent over your shoulders, then a forward step barbell lunge wouldn't be as applicable as walking lunges with resistance bands. The supinated single arm kettlebell swing would be a much better exercise for an MMA fighter than something like an American kettlebell swing, because it would do a much better job of mimicking the striking aspect of their sport, since when you throw an uppercut, you are doing so from a standing position, using a single arm, and you're not flexing your shoulder to the point where your arm is directly overhead. If you threw uppercuts with both hands at the same time until both arms were in line with your ears, then an American kettlebell swing might make sense during this training phase. Lastly, the slam ball overhead slam would be a much better exercise for an MMA fighter than something like an abdominal crunch because it would be a way to explosively train the core, which can help if someone is on top of you and you need to use that explosiveness to try to get out, or if you are on top of your opponent and you are doing ground and pound. Abdominal crunches just aren't intense enough to develop that explosiveness in the core and wouldn't be applicable at all to any MMA fighter. Those are just a few of the ways in which you can be more selective with your exercises. Hopefully, you now have a better understanding of the importance of exercise selection and why different training goals require different exercises. The next step will be to figure out the order and the placement of the exercises that you choose, but we'll be getting into that next week. For now, just feel confident that you know how to choose the right tool for the job. Thanks for hanging around until the end of the video. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like the video and comment down in the comment section as it would really help out with the algorithm. And also share this video so we can help get this information out to as many people as possible. And also subscribe to the channel by clicking on the icon in the bottom right hand corner and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on any of the videos. For those of you interested in health optimization, you can check out the video in the top right corner where I discuss the six foundation principles. And for those of you interested in optimizing your performance, then consider becoming a member it's only five dollars per month and you get a ton of perks including exclusive access to this program design lecture series playlist above my head